Thank you. It's really good to be here. I uh, especially appreciate the warm welcome that the uh, weather has brought as well. <laughs> That's okay, I grew up in northern Canada, so oh, it doesn't really bother me all that much. <laughs> it's nice to have a little winter. So some of you already heard me use this line today. I'm here tonight because in my first class in grad school, my prof said to me, you're going to be doing this for a long time. So if you're going to be studying something, you should study something you love. And the first thought I had was, I wonder if I can study video games. <laughs> Apparently you can. <laughs> so I want to start with two short stories that I share in my book. The first is a story of a man sitting in a computer in a cyber cafe in China. Not so long ago. He was staring intently at his screen playing video games and suddenly he slumped over. Bystanders rushed to help, but by the time he got to hospital, he was already dead. Now, heart attacks are unfortunately common, but this was a little bit different. It turns out after the fact that he had been playing video games for three days straight. And when the authorities looked into it a little further, they found out that he had spent thousands of dollars on video games before he died. News of the tragedy hit news wires around the world. That's why I know that. The second is the story of another young man staring at a different screen, eagerly awaiting it, waiting for it to open up a world of exploration and adventure in the 17th century Caribbean, living the life of a 17th century privateer. The young man didn't play for days, but he did play for hours, and sometimes every minute seemed like magic. This is particularly amusing today because the pixels on the screen were blocky and black and white. Nobody published a news story about this. But playing this game sparked the boy's imagination and gave him a lifelong knowledge of Caribbean history and geography to boot. I know this because that boy was me, sitting in front of a Commodore 64 a quarter of a century ago. How we frame a discussion about anything tends to affect what we think of it. If we ask the loaded question, are video games time wasters? Regardless of the eventual answer, we've already started out on a negative note. The best a game enthusiast is going to do in a situation like that is be successfully defensive. On the flip side, if we start off by asking something like, are video games the best contemporary form of entertainment, we put the critics in a defensive posture. So I want to be upfront about how I frame this discussion tonight. I see video games as a double-edged sword. The double-edged sword is a powerful metaphor for me. It can cut more than one way a double-edged sword can. It can be used to spread injustice or it could be used to protect the innocent. A sword is not a plow, it's not a chair, it's not a hat, it's not a pillow, it's always the same sharp-edged instrument. But the point is, aha, we can always use it for good or for ill. And this is exactly how I view media. A newspaper is not a book, a smartphone is not a clay tablet, but we can use each of them in positive or negative ways. In fact, probably any given feature of any given medium can be used for good or for ill. And that's the approach I'm going to be taking to video games tonight. Now, video games are, by some measure, one of the biggest forms of entertainment out there today. Some people claim they're even bigger than the movie industry, although I personally think that's a bit of an exaggeration. But with the boom in smartphone use, they are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. They're not just on consoles like the Xbox or PlayStation anymore. They are an everywhere medium, played by young and old, men and women, and even my mom. And as is typical of any relatively new medium, as is typical of any relatively new media, video games have spawned plenty of controversy. You may 
for instance, have heard once or twice about a connection between, say, video games and violence, for example. But we could also talk about whether or not video games are turning our kids into couch potatoes. We could talk about uh, the critiques of video games and godlessness or inappropriate behavior. I have opinions about all of these things, and I write about them in my book. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> Got to get it in sometime. But I want to focus tonight on the issue of video games and escape. Now, escape is a bit of a loaded word. I, I realize that. Generally, if we say something is escapist, we mean that at best, it's empty-headed fun, and at worst, it's Jersey Shore. <laughs> but I'm going to get to that negative perception in a little bit. But for now, I'm going to ask you to try the impossible. I want you to shelve those negative connotations. I want you to think instead of escape as a double-edged sword, because what I'm going to argue tonight is that video games can be used for ill, yes, but they can also be used for good. So let's get back to the story of the man who dies in, in the, the cyber cafe after playing too many video games. Now, if you're a gamer like me, and I know that there's a bunch of you in this room, if you're a gamer like me, you know that it's often hard to stop playing a video game. If, and this is completely hypothetical, someone is trying to talk to you about, say, bringing the kids to school tomorrow morning, it can be a little hard sometimes to stop tapping on the keys, to put down the controller, to tear your eyes away from the screen, and, oh, look, another level. <laughs> what was that here? Okay, maybe you haven't had that experience. The point is uh, that this is a problem that many gamers face. In some cases, however, it goes beyond just having trouble stopping. There are a few very well-publicized cases of people dying at the end of very long gaming sessions. It's not just one person this has happened to. And far more common are stories about people who are losing their bank accounts, losing their job, losing their marriages because they won't stop playing video games. Now, when people talk about video games as being addictive, they mean the game kind of takes over. It's so pleasant, like a drug, that it's hard to, to put it down, to stop playing, maybe even impossible. The crazy thing about video games is that people you'd never expect can really get hooked on them. I mean, the stereotype we see in pop culture is the guy, college guy, who's playing World of Warcraft, right? But Moms and professionals and lots of other people can get just as hooked on something as simple as Farmville or Song Pop or even Minesweeper. I've seen my dad at this game before. It's pretty crazy. Now, this is, this is the negative side of escape. We can use video games to escape responsibilities, to escape relationships with the people that are closest to us, to escape problems that we really need to face. So, just why do games have this reputation for causing addiction? There are probably many reasons, but one of the most notable ones is that video games are Skinner boxes. What's a Skinner box? That. B.F. Skinner was a psychologist who's famous for putting rats in a box and doing things for them to see how they respond. He was trying to train or condition certain kinds of behaviors in the rats. Now, often this involved using food rewards to encourage certain behaviors. So they would teach a rat to press a lever, and they would deliver a food reward for pressing the lever. And that trained the, the rat to associate eating with the lever. Then Skinner and his assistants would play around with how often the rat received a treat. And what they found, he and his assistants, was absolutely fascinating, and it actually really informs game design today. What they found was this. If the research, researchers delivered food pallets at a regular interval, like say every 10 minutes, the rats didn't bother with the lever because they get their food regardless of what they did. They didn't press the lever pretty much at all. If, on the other hand, they gave the pellet after a regular number of presses, say you get a food pellet every 10 presses, what would happen is that the rat would, would press the lever, but they'd be fairly relaxed about it, because the fact is, whenever they were hungry, they knew what they could do to get the food. 
But if the researchers varied the rate at which the lever presses resulted in food rewards at random intervals, the rats went nuts. Because you never know when the next press could deliver a food reward. It could be the next one. It could be the next one. Come on, lucky sevens. Come on, lucky sevens. Right? You've seen this before, right? It's gambling. Right? This is gambling in a nutshell. The best gambling games from a casino's perspective are ones where the casino can say exactly how much money will be paid out, but, the, but make the player feel like the next game might be the one that wins it all. Thus, the ideal gambling machine? Slots, of course. Totally controlled winnings delivered at random intervals. So, what does that have to do with video games? Well, aside from the fact that the vast majority of slot machines today are, in fact, video games, many non-slot machine video games employ the exact same mechanism. Most video games provide rewards for accomplishing something in a game. So, for example, in role-playing games, when you kill an enemy, you get some kind of reward like, you know, loot, uh, a special sword, or uh, uh, level up, a special ability, something like that. In many casual and free-to-play games, the rewards are often purely cosmetic items, like they function like stuffed animals at a farm, uh, at a fair, sorry, not a farm. Uh, <laughs> Farmville, that's why I was thinking about this. Farmville built an empire by selling people designer digital tractors, essentially. But rewards can be more than just stuff. They can be achievements, like finishing off a level, or getting a new plot point in a story. The games that tend to be most addictive are the ones that make it easy to get rewards early on. But then the game starts to make those rewards more and more difficult to get. Of course, the further you go in the game, the more powerful the items, the more wonderful the treasures that you can get, but you have to invest more and more time to get those wonderful rewards. And the real kicker is that the really good loot, the stuff that you're waiting for as a player, you never know when it's actually going to drop. I know that this low-level spud character that I'm attacking right now, he's probably not carrying anything of real value to me, but you never know. He might have that sniper rifle that I'm looking for. So I'm going to attack him. Oh, you didn't have it? Well, I'll just keep playing for a few mo more minutes just to see if, you know, the next one has it. Now, lest you think that this is by accident, let me assure you, it is not. The earliest video game designers didn't consciously employ psychological research, although they kind of intuitively got it right, typically. But today, developers do, in fact, hire psychological experts so that they can turn gamers, essentially, into those rats in the Skinner box. It's not by accident. And it's more, just, more than just the delivery reward schedule that actually can be addictive to players. Sometimes it's the rewards themselves. There's a lot of video games that create items that may not have a great deal of functional value, but they're unique, they're rare, they're special, and they're the kind of things that you can show off to people, like your epic flying mount, level 70, whatever it is. I don't even know where World of Warcraft is anymore. But, uh, the, the point is that these special items really appeal to our desire to hoard things. We all kind of like to be pack rats at various times, and game, video games provide all kinds of opportunities to collect full collections of imaginary stuff, right? It's, it's a really big part of these games. There's also a strong social component to many video game addiction things. There are many, many, many stories of gamers who got to the point of saying, you know what, I need to quit. But then their friends found out. And their friends whined, and they cajoled, and they threatened, until the resolve to quit was destroyed. And finally, video games are very, very good flow machines. The psychological concept of flow is an idea created by psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi to describe a psychological state 
of intense, enjoyable concentration. And it's not just any kind of concentration. It's concentration when doing activities that are challenging yet feasible, have clear goals, and give clear feedback. It's that feeling we get when we're working hard at something and absolutely tuned into it and everything outside just ceases to exist, right? Now this can happen with just about anything. When we're jogging, when we're writing poetry, when we're doing accounting. Any accountants here? Some people really get into that stuff. So, you know, that's, that's an example of something that can produce a flow state. But video games, <coughs> video games are really good at producing flow states. They push players because a game with no challenge is boring. But the thing is, they're not just challenging, they're feasible. They ratchet up the difficulty at the level that the player can handle. You don't get to Pac-Man level 3 until you've done Pac-Man level 2. Not only that, but video games give you very clear goals, and then they give you really clear feedback telling you exactly how well you're doing with those goals. I know when I play Pac-Man that I'm trying to get the high score. And I have a constant running tally at the top. That's what a score meter is. It's feedback. It's giving you information on how well you're doing. So not all video games do this very well, but in general, video games are very good at producing flow states. And when you are in that pleasurable mode of concentration, it's very, very hard to put it down sometimes. In short, many video games seem to be purpose-built to help players escape and then stay away. They employ psychological conditioning with the delivery of rewards. They encourage pack rat behavior. They're often stocked with friends that won't let you leave. And they give a real psychological high. Now, this is not to say that the case for video games as addictive machines is airtight. There are many people, especially gamers, who like to push back against the idea of video game addiction. First, many note that video games fit a long-standing cultural pattern of distrusting new stuff. The fact is that while every new technology has its enthusiastic boosters, there are always haters. Socrates, for example, distrusted writing. The Luddites distrusted power looms. And your mom doesn't like Facebook, especially when it comes to stalking your kids and playing words with friends. Okay, maybe not that last one so much. But the bigger point is that we tend to single out new technologies when they're just invented and focus very heavily on their downsides. And while those downsides may be very real, a funny thing happens to them after we get used to the technologies. We, start paying, we stop paying any attention to them. When you talk to many educators who are worried about new media, they like to really boost reading as a really, really important thing. And I'm actually on board with that. My daughters, I'm, we're really big on them learning to read and learning to read well and write, same thing. Uh, but the thing is, this line of thinking tends to focus exclusively on the positives of print and the negatives of new media. It's an unbalanced analysis. So, I think it's reasonable to ask that we might be, are we, in exaggerating the risks of video game addiction. That's not to say that it's not real or not a real possibility, but it's also important to ask whether or not we're exaggerating it. It's also quite reasonable to ask if media addiction has less to do with the medium and more to do with the underlying problems. Because the fact is, we can get addicted to just about anything, from stamp collecting to reading. And yes, reading. I do have trouble stopping playing video games. This is something that is a continual issue for me that I struggle with. But my wife knows that when I get a novel I like, I'm essentially gone for several days in a row. I might play a game 30 minutes too long. But when I get a Harry Potter novel or a Jar Jar Martin novel, I, 
I don't read for 30 minutes too long. I read for hours too long. And I get to 3 o'clock in the morning and realize that I need to stop. Is it reasonable to critique a gamer for a two or three hour session and not do the same for a reader? Now, I realize we're talking about addiction, and two to three hour sessions of anything doesn't qualify as addiction. The point is, though, that when people engage in really unhealthy play or really unhealthy reading or really unhealthy stamp collecting, when those things get to the point that they ruin lives, it's fair to question whether it's the thing itself that's the problem or something else. And the fact is that people who are healthy, who are happy, who are well-adjusted, may occasionally play a video game too long, but they're very, very unlikely to end up truly, truly addicted. <coughs> when you start poking through the stories of people who report game addiction, a common theme that you find in almost all of them is that the player was deeply unhappy about something. It might have been that they just lost their job, that they've had a breakup, uh, that they're frustrated, that they're not realizing their life's dreams, that they feel like they're stuck in a dead end of life. They have problems. And the game becomes a convenient way to hide from those problems. Is it really the game that's the source of the addiction then? The fact that people can get addicted to a lot of different things suggests that maybe the answer isn't quite as obvious as it might first seem. This is one of several reasons that professional psychologists are actually divided on whether video game addiction is a clinical condition. The fact is that the APA and the AMA have both rejected calling video game addiction an official diagnosis. One of the challenges is the one that I've just mentioned. Are video games the cause of addiction, or are they simply one of many possible things that could attach an addiction to? Another challenge is figuring out what the key features of video game addiction should be. Is it the amount of time played? There are social scientists who argue, no, that's a terrible measure. It's not a complete measure by itself because there are instances, socially, scientifically documented instances, of people who are very heavy video game players, but when it comes down to it, uh, they report being happy, healthy, well-adjusted, they have good jobs, they have strong relationships. That doesn't really seem like addiction. Other researchers point to salience as a key term for defining addiction. And salience is a term that they use to describe how much of a person's thinking is taken up by the addiction in question, or the possibly addictive thing in question. So if a video game is occupying every moment of your waking thought, if it's taking over your life in terms of your, your thought processes, then maybe you're addicted. But the problem here is that no one can really agree on whether or not salience should be part of the definition and exactly what salience means. And there are other terms that are being thrown around. The long and the short of it is that while researchers might eventually settle on a definition of addiction that will be widely held, and they do agree that there is such thing as problem gaming, the fact is that right now no such definition exists. Now there are some gamers who want to take these complications and they want to argue that game addiction is the real problem. Personally, I think that's taking things a little bit too far. I think it's fair to say that video game addiction isn't a simple thing. I think it's fair to say that game addiction is often due to players trying to avoid something unhappy in their life. Maybe that's even the majority of cases. I don't know. I think we exaggerate the downside of games in relation to other media and technologies. But I still think there's a problem. I really do believe that games are more potentially addictive than other activities. I mean, does anyone seriously want to argue that video games are just as addictive as, say, cleaning the cat litter? I mean, we use video games to hide, but as one former game addict wrote in an essay, they are very good places to hide. And in some cases, game makers purposely try to foster that unhealthy behavior. So I do think there's some danger here. But if video games are potentially that bad, why bother taking the risk? I mean, is there anything that would make playing a game a sane course of action? We could, of course, give the realists answer. 
And the realist would say, well, it doesn't matter what we think of it. People are going to play, so we might as well figure out the best way to manage that. And I guess that's not an unreasonable position, but you realize what happened there. Video games have now assumed the status in that statement uh, of junk food, right? You can play games, you know, you can eat junk food. As long as you don't have too much of it, it's not going to be unhealthy for you, but it's never going to be a good thing. But I think there's a positive case to be made for escape. A case that video games can quite simply be a positive force. A case that was originally made by Christian scholars C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, long before video games first appeared. They talked about the power of secondary worlds, what we might call alternate realities or imagined worlds. And I think that has everything to do with video games. So just what are alternate realities or imagined worlds? I actually think this is a pretty popular concept nowadays. Space, the final frontier. Once upon a time in a magic kingdom, and a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I wanted to put Battlestar Galactica in too, but I didn't have a good phrase to focus there. <laughs> so whenever we tell any kind of story, even a nonfiction story, we're asking our audience to imagine with us another place at another time. That other place could be next door. It, that time could be last week. Or it could be a deeply different setting, such as the 19th century Mars of John Carter, or the dark dystopia computer world of the Matrix. J.R.R. Tolkien, who was author of The Lord of the Rings, called such imaginary places secondary worlds because they are built off, off of, or patterned in some way off of, the primary worlds that we live in here and now. But is this really that much of an insight? I mean, every story needs a setting, right? And that's true. But the importance of setting is not the same in all stories. See, you can have a story where the imaginary world is a sloppily constructed afterthought, which is really just a stage for an action-packed event-a-minute story featuring, say, robots. In contrast, you can also have a story where the plot and the characters are, are almost an excuse to stop and smell the singing flowers, to stand on crystal cliffs and take a look over carnivorous forests, to ride over purple waves on the back of a pteranodon in a dying planet. In short, sometimes the story is an excuse to see a world. It's this kind of story that Tolkien loved. And you can see it in his masterwork, The Lord of the Rings. It's a terribly paced novel by many people's standards. We have diversions into totally pointless places like Tom Bombadil's hut and the Barrow Downs and, and, and we're subject to giant rambling histories of the Hornburg and, and the ants and, and, and the dead marshes and I love it. You, you've got maps and, and appendices and, and detailed histories on, on Glorfindel and the proper pronunciation of, of Sindar and words. It, it's like geek heaven. <laughs> okay. It's not for everyone, but the point is that Tolkien and, and other authors like C.S. Lewis and, and Frank Baum, who wrote all the Oz books, uh, they were far more in love with places and with things than with individual characters and plot lines. The thing is, novels and movies, they're actually pretty inefficient delivery tools for people who love worlds, who love alternate realities. Books and movies have to keep the plot moving along. I mean, much as I dislike Michael Bay's style of storytelling, he knows his medium. Transformers movies are unlikely to get bogged down in interminably long conferences of talking heads. If Frodo stops and enjoys the scenery for too long, the story stalls. Right? So this is where video games come in. See, video games 
are incredibly powerful tools for building worlds. Video games have all the tools at the filmmaker's disposal, such as compelling visuals, a, a moving soundtrack, a engrossing dialogue, and, and interesting characters. But what's really cool about video game secondary worlds is that you can touch them and you can play with them. I, not literally, of course, but when I turn left in Assassin's Creed, the dusty buildings of Jerusalem spin around. When Mario dies underwater, there are bubbles and he has to swim. And when I pick up the weighted companion cube in the testing facility of Portal, it comes with me. Duh. Isn't that the way it's supposed to happen? Well, the point is, I can't do any of that in a movie or a book. In a movie, I go where the camera goes. I see what the director and the producer want me to see. In a book, I read what the author has written. I can imagine other possibilities, but I can't do anything with the text itself. In a video game, I have space to bump up against the limits of the world. I can test it, I can prod it, I can see how it works. I don't have complete freedom in a video game. When I was playing Red Dead Redemption, much as I wanted to, I couldn't get my character to make a milkshake. Just not possible, the game doesn't program for it. But I have a lot more that I can do with something like that, a game like that, than what I can do with a movie or with a book. And increasingly in video games, I can encounter these worlds in any order that I want to. So-called open-world games may have storylines, but they allow the player to leave those storylines at any time and just go exploring. So, for example, in the game Fallout 3, you're going to look for your long-lost father. But as soon as I get out of that vault, I can just wander around the nuclear-blasted landscape of Washington, D.C. as much as I want to. I can take odd jobs, I can just wander around and shoot things for a while. Uh, that's what open-world games allow for. Imagine being able to stop the plot bus in The Lord of the Rings and kick around the mines of Moria or the elvish forest of Lothlorien for a while. That's what an open world game allows you to do. When you put the sound and the visuals and the open world play all together, I believe it makes video games incredibly powerful at building and delivering secondary worlds. And what secondary worlds video games have given us? Why, there are amazingly detailed planets where we find hostile aliens and shoot them. There's worlds of magic and mystery where we find hordes of hostile orcs and eviscerate them. There are gritty westerns full of dusty tumbleweeds where we hunt down vicious bandits and shoot them. And of course, there's dark dystopian worlds where super soldiers are hunting each other down and shooting each other. So, uh, Maybe the mainstream of video <coughs> games is just a little predictable. These games actually that I just showed are all pretty good games, at least they're well constructed, even if they're a little cliche and just a tad violent. And I'm giving you a caricature of the video game world. The fact is the artistry of making video games has blossomed in the last decade like never before. With the rise of a truly indie game scene, we're now starting to see the creation of some tremendous, tremendously creative and intriguing and amusing and compelling worlds. Now, I wish I had the time to take you through some of my favorites, all of my favorites, really, but for now, we're just going to stick with one particular game that I'd like to show off tonight. It's a game called Flower, and uh, it's an art house indie title where you play, no, uh, where you play a Flower petal. <laughs> it's a little bit more exciting than it sounds there. I'll, I'll explain in just a second here. Um, the reason I want to show it to you is that it's completely non-violent. The actions are very simple, and it's an incredibly uh, beautiful game. It has some, some real uh, power to it. I'm going to turn the lights off here so that we can see a little bit better while I'm playing it.
probably asking, <coughs> okay, so it's interesting, different, not exactly what I expect from a video game, but isn't it all still a waste of time? Isn't this all still just frivolous escapism? Don't video games draw us away from the very real challenges and issues that, that God has set before us? As it turns out, Tolkien and Lewis were also concerned with this issue of so-called escapism. And they argued compellingly that God actually made us to escape. At the beginning of World War II, C.S. Lewis gave a wonderful sermon called Learning in Wartime. He was addressing a church full of Oxford scholars. And he quite reasonably asked them whether these scholars could justify uh, pursuing peaceful and esoteric work like history and literature research when young men were preparing to give their lives and the nation was mobilizing to produce munitions and, and bombs. And we can ask ourselves much the same questions today. How can we play video games in the face of widespread starvation and, and human trafficking and, and environmental degradation and, and clinical depression? Are we not being irresponsible? Lewis's answer is no. He argues that we are made as cultural beings. God has built us to learn, to think, to create, and yes, to play. This is part of what makes us beautiful. And it would be as impossible to repress this as it would be our breathing. Humans argue Lewis, propound mathematical theorems and beleaguered cities, conduct metaphysical arguments and condemned cells, make jokes on scaffolds, 
discuss the last new poem while advancing to the walls of Quebec and comb their hair at Thermopylae. This is not panache. It is our nature. God made us to be more than survival machines. Lewis puts it this way. It's worthwhile for a person to learn to save drowning people. It's worthwhile for that person to train for saving drowning people. And even for that person to sacrifice his or her own life for that of another. But if anyone devoted himself to life-saving... <laughs> there we go. We're missing our quotes up there. I didn't realize that. Sorry. Let me try that one more time. Computer. Let's try it again. There we go. But if anyone <laughs> devoted himself to life-saving, in the sense that it had, in the sense of giving it his total attention, so that he thought and spoke of nothing else, and demanded the cessation of all other human activities until everyone had learned to swim, he would be a monomaniac. Playing video games is a natural outgrowth of what it means to be a person. We play. That's one of the things that we're created to do. But why are secondary worlds so important? Why do we pour so much energy, imagination, and creativity into alternate realities? Tolkien wrote about this in his widely cited essay on fairy stories. He argued that we create because we have been made by a creator God. Fantasy, he says, remains a human right. We make it our measure and in our derivative mode because we are made. And not only made, but made in the image and likeness of a maker. Okay, but isn't it true that even the best secondary worlds are a pale imitation of what we call real life? It's certainly true of the hyper-detailed Lord of the Rings, and it's true of even the most compelling video game worlds. So what about this flight into fantasy is so powerful? And here I think we get into the heart of it. The reason I think video games can be so spiritually compelling, even if they so often fail to reach their true potential. Secondary worlds can help us re-enchant our everyday life. There's so much about life that we take for granted, so much that we don't notice. I mean, how many of you, for example, right now are thinking about how comfy those chairs feel on your rear end? You are now. More seriously, think of how life becomes a blur. Eat breakfast, get dressed, go to work, eat lunch, drive home, go to sleep, do it again tomorrow. I mean, I'm sure this highlights to our days that they're not all very humdrum. But what we're missing is that none of it is humdrum. Not really. Every moment of being alive is a miracle. That body that you never notice unless you're uncomfortable, it's, it's a marvel. Every unnoticed heartbeat, every ignored inhalation, every valve that you never see working, every piece of material has its own kind of beauty. Every mass-produced classroom chair Every clump of dirt in that irritating Michigan pothole, every mold stain on the side of a wall, it's all a remarkable part of creation if we just have eyes to see it. And that, argued Tolkien and Lewis, is what fantasy can do for us. A good secondary world allows us to rediscover wonder, to rediscover playfulness, amazement, and sometimes even awe. God had perfection in mind when he created this world, but the grime and slog of everyday life has made that perfection hard to see. We sometimes need to escape from this primary reality to see the magic of life in a less diluted form and bring it back to us, back with us to our primary world. C.S. Lewis put it this way, the child enjoys his cold meat, otherwise dull to him, by pretending it is buffalo, just killed with his own bow and arrow. And the child is wise. 
The real meat comes back to him more savory for having been dipped in a story. You might say that only then is it the real meat. If you are tired of the real landscape, look at it in a mirror. By putting bread, gold, horse, apple, or the very roads into a myth, we do not retreat from reality, we rediscover it. As long as the story lingers in our mind, the real things are more themselves. And this is why playing games does not have to be escapism, at least not in the ordinary negative sense. Exploring the world that video games make so vivid can be an exercise in re-enchantment. Now, I don't really mean to claim that every session of Halo or World of Warcraft or Fruit Ninja is going to be some kind of earth-shattering awakening of your inner consciousness. What I am saying is that creative, mindful escape can be a powerful thing. Even less thoughtful escape can give us a small taste of the re-enchantment that secondary worlds offer. So we're back to the double-edged sword to wrap this up. Video games are vehicles for escape. Escape to impossible places, and that escape might lead us to desert our responsibilities and avoid problems that need fixing, or it might help us to refresh ourselves, to regain a sense of wonder and beauty that can put color back into, some, into our everyday life. So, that's all well and fine, says the pragmatist, but what do we do about that? What's a smart way or a wise way to approach video games? And I think that's a fair question. Now, I can't give you clinically tested answers. I'm not a psychologist, but I can share with you my own approach. I think we first need to start by putting the danger of addiction in proper perspective. Those struggling with video game addiction are in a tight spot, and I don't wish to minimize that, but it's worth asking whether or not video games are such an incredibly high risk of creating addiction. And on that score, I think we can safely say that the vast majority of people who play video games do not end up addicted. There are tens or hundreds of millions of people around the world who play Angry Birds, Halo, Wii Sports. Very few of them end up playing compulsively to the point that it ruins their lives. There is risk here, but there's risk in all things. You accepted that risk by walking out of your room and coming over to this presentation because you risked injury on the way over here to listen to a lecture. Of course, there was also a risk of losing points if you didn't come for some of you, so I, I don't know. <laughs> kind of a balance there. So how do we deal with the risk that isn't, it is present? First, I think gamers need to be sensitive to their individual weaknesses. And I think every gamer is a different person. A lot of gamers apparently are susceptible to addiction from things like World of Warcraft. For me, those games have never really been a big problem for me because every time I've started playing one, it just seemed like so much work. I've just quit instantly. Um, but for me, turn-based strategy games, that's my poison. You put that in front of me and I have a really hard time stopping. So we need to be self-aware and we need to be self-monitoring as gamers. Are we losing sleep, not getting our work done? Are we starting to treat our morning commute as an episode of Gran Turismo or something like that? We may need to pull back a little bit at that point, right? And communities need to help. Friends, parents, siblings, significant others, children. We need to watch out for each other because sometimes I can see things about you that you can't. Now, it's important that this not turn into nagging or automatic negativism by non-gamers. And gamers need to avoid being reflexively defensive. But that watchfulness is on the whole a good thing. Because if we didn't care, we wouldn't watch. It's also worth noting that the best community accountability is based on clear expectations. My wife and I have agreed that since when I'm playing video games, I ignore my children, I keep my video gaming to after everyone else goes to sleep. That's our agreement. It works for us. And I think it's really important to note that community accountability actually means a lot more than monitoring gaming activity. Happy, well-adjusted people may occasionally play games too long, but they do not become addicted. In my opinion, the best antidote to problem gaming is the same antidote to the vast majority of problems in life, a strong community full of love and the Holy Spirit. But I don't want to end tonight with a discussion of how to cope, because again, that misses the bigger picture. Games aren't all risk with no upside. There's no question for me that video games can be a problem. There's no question that some people can use games to flee from the unpleasantness in the world. And in Tolkien's terms, the justified escape of the prisoner turns into the cowardly flight of the deserter. But I firmly believe that video games have the capacity to be a unique and powerful cultural tool. 
that can open up other worlds, that can provide refreshment, that can spur creativity and re-enchant our everyday life. Now, whether you play games or not, I pray that you can find the enchantment in this world that is hidden beneath the film of suffering and the mundane. We spent a lifetime collecting a treasure trove of gifts made by the great primary corrector, creator and then forgetting about them. May you find a secondary world that, as Tolkien says, can open your hoard and let all the locked things fly away like cage birds. The gems all turn into flowers or flames, and you will be warned that all you had or knew was dangerous and potent, not really effectively chained, free and wild, no more yours than they were you. Thank you. So uh, I have 7.30 on my timepiece, so we have a half an hour for question and answer, um, and uh, we'll go until we run out of things to talk about, and if anyone wants to stick around, I have a little bit of time afterwards, I have another commitment at 8.30, but otherwise I'm happy to sit and chat with people even after we're done with public Q&A. So, are there questions? And I should mention, can I get someone to run the mic to people who are asking questions? Because we're recording this, so they need it for... You want to do that? Yeah, I do. Okay. You want to ask the first question? Okay. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. So, I... It's interesting when you were talking about escapism um, and seeing the world in a new, a new uh, uh, beauty, new reality, whatever. Um, that's exactly the reason that I stopped playing video games a couple of years ago. Okay. Because for myself, uh, the video game world was becoming the mundane and the ordinary life. Because it was so common. Mm -hmm. Especially in the college atmosphere. Yeah. I just felt like uh, it was, you know, day to day, hour to hour. Video games are basically the common reality, the mundane. So to get out of it, um, I basically discovered through some friends, you know, hiking in adventure in that way. And that's, so I guess my question is, <clears throat> do you think that video games can become the mundane? Absolutely. Or, uh, or yeah, or entertainment in general. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Uh, any good thing can, can be used too much, and every person is different, and how they interact with something that is, has the potential for good can, can be different for someone else. What can be good for one person can be really problematic for another. And it can also change from time to time in your life as well, right? Um, there, may be a, there may come a time in your life where video games again appeal to you and that you, you actually get something positive from that. And uh, I don't think you need to freak out if that, that happens to you. What I was making an argument for tonight is that there's the potential. There's the potential. And wherever there's potential, frequently that potential will be wasted or it will fail even in spite of the best, you know, best efforts otherwise. Uh, so yes, video games certainly can become mundane. And uh, this is especially true, uh, those of you who are gamers have probably heard the term grinding before, right? Um, and grinding is when you play a game compulsively in a very repetitive manner. You're doing the same thing over and over again. And there are a lot of games that because you want to level up, you end up falling into this pattern of doing the same thing over and over and over again. It becomes very tedious and very humdrum. When something like that is happening, the refreshing power of a secondary world is totally gone, as far as I'm concerned. Um, maybe it's useful for sort of numbing your mind because you're too busy or something, I don't know. But, I mean, outside of that, I don't see the value in something like that. So obviously in that scenario, the game is not producing very much refreshment. But I think it's possible it's done right. Hold up your hand if you've got a question, and he'll bring you the mic, okay? Speak right into it, because it seems that that's uh, the pickup pattern. Uh, my question for you is, do you believe that video games are or can be a form of art? Absolutely. Yeah, there's no question in my mind. Here's, here's the issue, though. <laughs> I have a very broad definition of art. Essentially, uh, if it is something that you could in any way 
conceive of as a creative activity, I call it art. Now, I think there's good art, and I think there's bad art. But for me, the gate is very wide. There are other people who think of art in a much more exclusive sense. Art is something that reaches a higher plane uh, of, of thought or some special aesthetic level of beauty. And uh, even if you use that more restrictive uh, this definition, I believe that games can become art. Now, whether or not most of them are, by that more restrictive definition, is a little bit more open to debate. But it's a media form. If film can be art, and I believe it can by the artful use of, of uh, audio and video uh, along with, with narrative uh, crafting, I don't see why a video game can't as well. And there's an art to creating effective systems to play with. And if you really think about a lot of video games, especially simple puzzle games, that's what they are. They're, they're interactive systems. Something like Tetris doesn't have much in the way of art. It doesn't have much in the way, like visual art I mean, uh, it doesn't have much in the way of, of sound design. It, it really doesn't have much uh, in the way of narrative. None of that is there, and yet it's a really well-designed game. I would say the art is in the design of the interactive system there. Right? It's a very different kind of art, but I would still describe it as art nonetheless. Hi. Um, I thought your argument was really interesting, um, and one point that stuck out to me in particular uh, had to do with the difference between film and books and the video game world where you get to choose what happens next, and I'm curious your thoughts on that dealing with our culture as a narcissistic culture and being all about us, and what your thoughts are with that. Okay, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so the argument would go something along the lines of uh, when we read a book or watch a movie, we are, we are watching someone else. If we enjoy their path, if we enjoy their experience, it's sort of a, a I'm glad for you kind of experience, right? Whereas in a video game, because you are so tightly invested in a character, anything good that happens there is kind of vicariously experienced by me. It's all about me, 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 me. Um, and I think there's something to that. I think that that's, that's very much a fair potential criticism. Um, and if you really look at a large number of video games, a lot of them are, in fact, power fantasies. Right? Give me a big gun and let's see what I can do. Right? Give me the ability to form entire islands right? and, and make me feel like a god. Right? Um, and I would say that, that that certainly is in tune with the narcissistic culture. I don't know that it, I, I'm not sure whether you would say it causes it or reflects it. And the other thing is, I don't know that it has to be a narcissistic action. I can play one of those power fantasy games and just be thrilled that things work together. Or I could still be thinking of that avatar as someone else, in a sense, that I happen to be controlling. And there's a kind of disassociation going on in, in my mind as well. So I think you can play video games in a very narcissistic way. And I think you might even be able to argue that the medium has a kind of bias in that direction, or at least as we understand the medium today. But I don't think it has to be that way. If you think about flower, for example, um, I mean, you're controlling the flower pebble. I, I guess you could think of yourself as the flower stream, but I, I don't really think of myself as the center of the world when I'm playing that game. It's more like I'm, I'm there and I'm moving through this beautiful place and doing beautiful things. And, and I, I don't see that as kind of sort of feeding into a sort of narcissistic picture of myself. That's my take on it anyways. I, I imagine you can make a different argument. You said like about the chance to see the world in different ways in terms of the fantasy video games really interesting, but I had a question like you were equating video like the addiction to video games and the addiction to books and kind of the same thing, and even like the quotes of Lewis and Tolkien. I feel like the fantasy created by movies and books is kind of the same thing, but there's the medium which they can make also allows for deeper thematic elements, like to borrow a couple things from our habits of thought that they hold up a mirror. Like they use that as something to draw you in, but it also then shows you something and teaches you something. And I'm just wondering like, if you think that the medium through which video games are conveyed has the possibility for that deeper interaction with life, or is it just. 
That's, I mean, that's a really good point. Uh, and this gets into stuff that some of you have probably talked about in, in your pop culture classes, uh, those of your students uh, and studied some media theory. Uh, the medium is the message, right? That every medium has a bias, that it, it sort of pushes in certain directions. It has strengths and it has weaknesses in terms of what it can do well. And so when a video game and a film try to do the same thing, typically speaking, one's going to be a little bit better at doing it and, and the other's going to have to try a little harder, depending on what exactly we're talking about, right? Um, and I think that, that, uh, that to, to argue that you can get greater narrative depth in a movie or a, a novel is typically going to be right. I would say that typically uh, your, your, your novel or your, or your movie is going to have more time and more energy to, um, to go deeper into a story, right? Um, so it's a difference of approach, right? The, the gift that is given from the video game medium is, is not so much the narrative. You can deliver complicated narratives, but they're delivered very inefficiently in a video game. And the reason for that is that you have to give people freedom to explore, right? Well, you don't have to, but games that don't give freedom to explore, don't give freedom for move movement, those are games that aren't generally going to be viewed as, as interesting, essentially. But the problem with exploration is that it's really inefficient, right? And this is why using games as a teaching tool is... Uh, it can be very powerful, but it, it it's also it tends to be very inefficient as well. Um, because you've got to let people go down wrong paths, right? So if you want to deliver a specific narrative, you've got to wait until people actually find the next segment to trigger it, right? Or live through a particular element before they actually really develop the narrative. Whereas in a movie or in a book, you can basically lead people right to the next plot point when you think that the narrative pacing is right. So that kind of, of, of depth and uh, power of narrative is, I think, uh, better, stronger, typically, in a book or a movie. However, I think the experience of a secondary world, if it's well done anyways, is typically easier to do in a video game than it is in a book or, or, or a movie because of that power of exploration. The exploration allows us to, to take the shape of things, to to test them and prod them and, and get a sense of how they work. And so the secondary world takes on a different kind of tangibility in the mind of the player. And so that, I think, is the medium bias, the advantage of the video game. So in terms of plot and character depth and thematic depth and complexity, I, I think you're probably right. To get the same amount into a video game, you've got to play like five times as long as a movie would be, right? Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Kind of. What I was trying to get at is that, like, when you read a book or watch a movie, you're getting the same kind of like fantasy of pace, but like, I also feel like not in terms of like depth of narrative, but like it's it's trying to show you something. Well, not all of them, but like it has the opportunity to teach you something profound about life. Sure. Or something like that. I was just wondering, like, if you. If Video you games do too. That, Video games do too. They do have the uh, the uh, the possibility of of teaching uh, profound situations. Uh, because you're invested in the lives of the characters, sometimes when decisions come that are really, really difficult in a video game because of the narrative that's been built to that point, sometimes they can have a kind of power that a, a book won't have simply because you are so invested in that character because you've made the decisions, you've made the actions at that point in time. Uh, again, though, uh, the lessons that you might learn or the, the insights that you might gain from a video game will probably tend to be different than that of a book or a movie. Uh, sometimes the way that a world works in and of itself is in fact a message. Um, I was talking this morning with uh, one of the classes about this. We were talking about how if you did a simulation of healthcare and you had healthcare work in a certain way and not work very well in another way, that world, that system in and of itself would be sending a message. It's not the same as a story delivering a message, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not powerful, it's just a different kind of power, right? Other questions? There was someone at the back uh, a while ago, so, and then we'll come to the front here. So, um, I was wondering your opinion about this. So. Um, I am a music composer, and I was wondering, like, what effect do you think that um, music has 
in the uh, video game world and when you're playing it, like what effect might that have on the game? Uh, music in games is an interesting topic. It, it's, in many ways, the power of music in video games is almost exactly the same as the power of music in cinematic productions, right? So music can uh, set mood and atmosphere. It can cue anticipation for particular events. Uh, it can provide uh, a character to the piece through a thematic piece, for example, that continually reappears and is identified with the character. So it can build character, for example. All of those things are possible. What's interesting about video game music is that they, they, the last 15 years or so, they've really been experimenting quite successfully with making music systems in games interactive so that the music shifts in relation to what is actually happening at that moment in the game, whereas instead of being sort of a pre-planned sequence of tracks that just come up at random, right? Uh, so what you, end up, what you end up seeing, what you end up getting is uh, a scenario like a, one of the indie games that I really like called Faster Than Light, uh, which is a space combat simulator. The composer does this sort of uh, techno uh, electronic music uh, soundtrack, which is, which is interesting. But what's really interesting is that for each theme he did, he did two versions of them. So he did the peaceful version, and then he did the battle version. And as soon as you engage battle, the theme stays on exactly the same notes, at exactly the same point in the score, but it switches to the other arrangement, essentially. And that's one example of how you can shift music, and it becomes totally integral to the playing experience at that point. And it's hard to separate the music from the overall aesthetic experience of the game. So I think that uh, music and games, and there's actually a fair amount of scholarship on music and video games as well. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with that. Uh, so it's a great topic if you're at all interested in looking into it. In the front? And, uh, oh, okay. All right. We give professors priority here. Here we go. Can you just comment on the kind of influence or the kind of conversion that refers to different uh, media coming together? Video games and, and the movie and the book and fandom and all that stuff and, and places where, what, where do you see that going? What did you say? Maybe you think about that. Yeah, I, one of the big uh, terms that you, you hear in, in uh, both media industries and in, in uh, academic literature is convergence, right? The idea that the computer allows all these different media to come together, and, and the video game is, is, of course, as a computerized medium, is, is the prime example of, of that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, your video game can be your film, can be a book, can be a radio broadcast, can be all of those things at the same time sometimes. So for example, when you're playing Fallout New Vegas, you're, you're looking out across uh, a landscape, you see a billboard with a faded painting on it. Uh, you have uh, a little wrist thing that you can, you can look at with a sort of a, a computer screen, so a computer within a computer. Uh, you can pick up publications or pieces of paper and look at them. Uh, you, can, you can listen to radio stations uh, at the same time. So uh, video games are, are, in a sense, emulating all those other media. But what's really important to note is that they're remediating all those media. They're taking them and turning them into something else. A film in a game is not the same as a film outside of a game, right? It's a film that's done for the game's purposes. So uh, it, it really transforms it. Um, and uh, uh, video games are, are remediation machines, uh, uh, are excellent remediation machines. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not very good at prognosticating. Like, I, I don't really know uh, what the next new development is. I know what the industry would like it to be is, is uh, greater use of 3D graphics, but uh, they really tried to push for that a few years back, and along with the 3D screens, uh, the 3D widescreens and HDTVs and stuff like that, and really uh, hasn't caught on all that significantly. So it's questionable whether the public is ready for that technology just yet. Uh, other futurists uh, think about direct neural interface with, with video games. Um, uh, and there have been experiments with that, uh, but I think we're still a little while away from that as well. I think for the time being, 
I think what you're just going to see is that because video game makers have the ability, they will just continue to pick and choose and grab from other media as they feel comfortable, essentially. Uh, and so you'll see a tremendous diversity of games. There are some games that really try to feel book-like. They, they, they aren't, but they try to sort of evoke that sense of bookness. And there are other video games that try to uh, create a feel of, you know, cel-shaded animation, you know, Walt Disney-style stuff. Uh, and there's other games that, that uh, there are actually games, and then, believe it or not, there are audio-only games. Experimental stuff. Uh, but uh, you can actually get one on Xbox uh, Live Indie, uh, the, the indie arcade game, if you're at all interested in this. Um, you, you have to, I can't remember the title, so you have to look it up online, but there is an audio-only game, and you're basically you're in a dungeon, so it's pitch black, and as you turn around, you, the sound shifts, uh, so you can sort of hear the monsters or whatever around you, uh, and, and you can't see anything except blackness. So, uh, video games can pull on that as well. I've seen an experimental version of, of something like that as well. So, as multimedia machines, they can do some pretty incredible stuff. Question down the front. And then, uh, oh, oh. <laughs> you brought attention to the success of shooter games. Where yeah. you go and you shoot people. And I know that one of my personal video games is Lego games where I can destroy everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I was wondering why you feel so compelled to games where you can destroy things or kill people. What, like, why are we so attracted to games where we can shoot other things? Because we're wicked. Um, I think we talked to, I, I, I did this presentation again uh, yesterday and uh, uh, we talked a little bit about this I don't, I don't think there's a simple answer to that question I think uh, there, there are multiple possible motivations right? in some cases uh, a rush can come from um, uh, emotional release, a, a release of frustration. I think that can be a really, really important thing. Um, uh, blowing off steam is, is the term that a lot of people use. Uh, there's sometimes also a sadistic pleasure that can come from those things as well. That uh, it's well documented that people, not everyone, but enough people, um, really like to cause suffering and to see suffering as sick as that sounds. Uh, and sometimes I think games become vehicles for people to exercise that desire. Um, I, I don't know, like in the case of Lego, it's, it's, it's like, like with the Lego games, it's exactly like a little kid building a bunch of sandcastles and then turning into a dinosaur and going rawr, and stomping all over them again, right? Um, I don't know, I mean, you could look at that and you could say, well, that's evidence of brokenness, that original sin, and, uh, uh, you know, it's a demonic influence, and it's, you know, it's at a childlike level, right? But that's, I've heard people actually make that very argument, that when kids step on ants or, uh, uh, you know, uh, wreck sand castles and things like that, that that's what they're exercising. <sighs> I, I, I don't have a really good articulation as to why, but for some reason that rubs me the wrong way. It doesn't feel entirely right for me. Um, there's something, it, it's like swashbuckling adventure, right? Three Musketeers and stuff like that where there's great adventure and people are sword fighting and, and you know, there's the cheesy movies where the, the, the enemy soldier gets shot and he, oh, then he like, you know, falls over backwards but there's no blood and it's all like, it's, it's this, this sort of campy over the top kind of thing. Adventures like that are exciting, and, and they're fun, and there's heroism, and there's, there's bravery, and, and, it, and it's not too serious either, right? Um, and again, on one level, I think you can make a pretty compelling case that you shouldn't idolize any of that thing, and you shouldn't think it's positive, and it should all be you know, viewed with suspicion, but I don't know. That's some of my favorite childhood memories right there, you know? And, well, not even just childhood. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I, I, I don't know, is it, is it really that I'm just corrupt and, and uh, that that's appealing to me? I think that 
that uh, destruction doesn't always actually have to be a negative thing, if that makes any sense. So uh, maybe, maybe uh, th that's part of a natural human impulse as well. It's hard to create sometimes if you don't destroy. I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's, that's all that pops into my head right now. Uh, pushing the front and up there. And then I think that might be it. So uh, this gentleman here, and the, the man in the red jacket there, and I think we'll wrap it up. So um, you talked about how video games can be addictive if they're used obviously enough. And then also about how they kind of provide an escape from the mundane like reality. And that's also, it's very similar to a lot of ways that people use substances, like more some of the more dangerous things. So why do you think it is that like as Christians we're so quick to eliminate or like shun different substances and stuff, but we in some, a lot of cases embrace video games even though they can be just as addictive. Wow. Um, <clears throat> and to add to that really quick, not even <laughs> not even not even the illegal illegal substances, but the, the way you were describing video games is pretty similar to chocolate or alcohol, you know? Like, this is, you know, banned by our school here, alcohol drinking, but it's, it's similar as a slightly addictive, it's escape from reality slightly. <laughs> Not that we're ganging up on you, are you? Not that you're trying to get me to say something that's going to make me persona non grata here forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I don't think I don't think that on the spot I'm going to be able to give you a satisfying answer. Um, I I think I'd have to think a little bit about the distinction between substance and between mental experience. In a sense, it's all neurochemistry, right? Um, I will say when you talk about say chocolate. Uh, enjoying it for its taste uh, is, is a, um, I think it's a blessing, right? I think that to be able to enjoy chocolate for its taste or a good pizza like I did tonight or, or, or something along that line. Uh, there's, there's a real blessing and there are, there, are, you know, there are other things that come along with that that are blessings as well. Um, so I don't think that... Uh, um, that me identifying the pleasures of video games necessarily is going to rule out any other kind of pleasures. I, I don't know what the connection between them would be without sort of a little bit more careful thought about it. Sorry, I'm not going to give you anything more than that right now. <laughs> so uh, you repeatedly talk about the, uh, the whole secondary world aspect. How closely do you think that is tied with the artistic elements of the game? Because there was like a big jump between the art of the 8th generation and the 16th generation and on and on things. Do you think the effect of the secondary world is tied to the, the uh, exponential growth of this? That's a really good question, and I would say no. My, my argument is quite strongly no. Um, and the reason I say that is because game worlds could be compelling even with, with simpler, simpler graphics. I, I, I experienced this firsthand. Um, when I was, what, the moment that really made video game worlds, uh, the realization of the power of video game worlds come alive for me was back in 1994, I think, when I was playing X-Wing. Now, by today's standards, the graphics in X-Wing are, are pretty laughable. They're really simple. They're very, they're very crude. Um, uh, I'll say we're worlds better than what I was playing with even like 10 years before that. But, but uh, there was a moment when I was playing, and I was flying my X-Wing along, and I was busy uh, shifting energy from my rear shields to my forward shields because I was getting attacked from the front. And I suddenly realized, and this sounds so stupid, but I'd never thought of it this way before. I was like, this is how it works. This is how it works in the movies. When, when you're seeing the X-Wings flying around, this is what they do. This is, this is the machinery that's going on in that story that I just watched before. Right? 
it had nothing to do with the graphics. It had everything to do with the function of the machine that I was flying. And these games that I played when I was a kid that looked like absolutely terrible or in a retro sense kind of cool, today, uh, those games, they were deeply compelling to me because I could imagine and the actions that I made actually had effects in those worlds. So when I walked around, I actually walked around and I could go places and I could do things. And so the function of that world was in many ways the thing that deepened my emotional attachment to it. So I don't think the compellingness of the secondary worlds of video games comes exclusively from the graphics. But I will say it's a big bonus, yeah. right? If we look at Flower, now, if you'd had some time to sit here and play it, and, and by the way, I'll invite you up to the front if anyone wants to play around with it for a few minutes, you're welcome to do that. We'll turn the volume down so we can talk. But um, uh, if you just see Flower, what really impresses most people about it is the graphics, right? That it, it looks really pretty. Um, and it looks a lot better in high depth, by the way. Uh, and I, I think that is a powerful thing that really builds that secondary world up. But I think it's the function, more than anything else, that really makes it powerful. Effect on the user? Yeah, absolutely. And the effect on the user has everything to do with the combination of things, and graphics is one of those. But I really do think it's the function of the world, the, the play with the world, that I think that makes it really powerful. So it is 8 o'clock on my watch. I will uh, stick around for at least 15 or 20 minutes, and if anyone wants to talk to me, great. I will also be selling these copies. I don't want to leave with these. Ten dollars, okay, which is just like I just rounded off to ten dollars. He's giving it away. He's giving it away. It's pretty much the cost that I paid for them. I, I just I I want to I want to move them and, and tell your friends about it. And uh, if you have a youth pastor, share it with them. Uh, so here you go. If Thank you.